Our next speaker is uh, Yavor Ivanov, Global Head of Database Administrator at uh, PlaySafe Safe and uh, Principal AWS User Group, uh, Participant AWS User Group, Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, Yavor does uh, database uh, for a living since uh, 1999. He has free AWS certification and uh, six Oracle certification. Wow. Uh, certified master uh, and other valuable certification, including uh, in international leadership and psychology at work. Yaur, Yaur's ha heart is uh, in technical detail, while his experience helped him to see the bigger picture. Yaur will talk uh, about migrating uh, from Oracle Exadata to AWS RDS Oracle. Please share your questions and the best questions as usual. Uh, we'll get the AWS credits and uh, prize from NX. Yawar, hi, can see you. Hello. Hello. Can you see me? How are you? Hear me? Yeah, awesome. So the stage, stage is yours. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm ready to start. Uh, what I'm going to share here is uh, a result of a team effort. The Passive Database Solutions team uh, was working on a number of uh, really complex database migrations from Oracle X data into AWS. And in the following slide, there is a lot of blood and tears and hard work. Uh, and the curious thing is that I'm not a consultant, I'm not a uh, uh, AWS employee or, or other consultant. So I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just uh, willing to share our experience and by our, I mean, uh, here in Paysafe. Uh, let's start with, uh, thank you, Dmitry, for, for introducing me. I do databases for living uh, since the 20th century. So uh, two centuries already. Uh, I have the privilege to be uh, head of a uh, very bright database solutions team in Paysafe which is located in uh, Europe and North America. One of the smartest DBAs you can find out there uh, are, are in Paysafe. And uh, three years ago, even less than three years ago, we got the task to migrate our really uh, wonderfully running workloads from on-prem exadata to AWS. Uh, in this presentation, I have to tell you, I have more information that I can share in the allotted time or even in, in, in two or three hours. Uh, I will send the slides to, uh, to the organizers. They will share them with you. I will also post them in my LinkedIn uh, accounts. You can find me in LinkedIn. Uh, there is a lot of information in the slides. I really value uh, the communication. So uh, if you have a way of asking questions, uh, Dmitry, don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, anything if you see the questions coming i don't need to reach to the end of the presentation i will reach as far as i can uh, i prefer to discuss uh, real real world questions so without further ado uh, let me define the challenge uh, i really enjoyed the, the conference so far but so far i've heard a lot of application specific things and the database topic is kind of the database, I see it as a, as a big white elephant that is kind of hard to approach in NOS. Uh, so let me show you what I mean. Uh, first, I guess lots of the uh, people here on this conference are seasoned AWS uh, customers. Uh, I would say we are such already, but we were not where, when we started. I'm running, I'm working in Paysafe for 12 years, more than 12 years. And ever since I joined in 2010, we are constantly moving. With, we are merging with other companies. We are moving from one data center to the other. We are moving from UK to Frankfurt, Vienna. We have data center in Isle of Man, in Canada, uh, Toronto, Montreal, everywhere. So moving from one data center to the other is something trivial and, and is something that we are really competent uh, in doing so. We, when we got this uh, challenge from our management to move to AWS, initially without 
uh, much AWS knowledge, I was thinking, okay, just another move. Okay, we will not own the data center, but it will be yet another migration. I was so wrong. The next few words are extremely important and I believe you all know them, but let me be straight here. Cloud is not just someone else's computer. Cloud is not just another data center. Cloud is not your typical move from here to there. Uh, if you approach to the cloud as just someone else's computer, you will pay a dear price and not reap re re any benefits. The cloud, and now I know it after three years of <laughs> uh, fighting with this, I know it. What, a cloud is more way of thinking. You don't you don't approach cloud as, as, as a typical data center. I get it, it's trivial for you and it's easy for me to say now, uh, three years later, but it kind of needs to sink into your, into your bones if you want to be, uh, into be successful in the migration to the cloud. Now, having said this, uh, I have to uh, add another warning. What I'm going to speak now is for migrating Oracle database workloads from on-prem to AWS. And not only Oracle database workloads, but Oracle database workloads running on Exadata. Exadata is a wonderful piece of engineering that Oracle developed for 15 years ago, or maybe even more. It, it, it's really a, a genius piece of machinery. And you will see in a few slides what, what I mean. But generally, AWS are saying they are six ways to migrate your workloads to AWS, the six R's, like uh, re-architect, re whatever. I say there are three ways, the good, the bad, and the ugly way. And I'll start from the ugly. The ugly way to move to AWS is to go to, uh, is to start using EC2. EC2 is just someone else's computer. EC2 means that you go, you provision your Linux, you install your Oracle binaries, uh, you provision some storage, like every cloud has some uh, storage and has some compute, so why don't we use it? But running on EC2 means that you are actually not in the cloud. You are in a very, very expensive data center. So you don't want to do this. Sometimes you have to do it uh, because all the other uh, techniques have some limitations, but this is really, really last uh, resort. This is the only way. The bad way is using Oracle RDS. Oracle, uh, AWS provides us with this magnificent service called a, a Relational Database Service, where you get predefined, pre-configured database uh, servers, and you just need to put your data, and with the shared responsibility model, uh, AWS take care of the boring tasks, like uh, high availability, like backups, all the things that Deloitte are interested in, and you take care of your data. I'm saying this is the bad way, and you will see why, but let me give you a hint. It's, this is the bad way because this is the best way to run Oracle in AWS, but you actually don't want to run Oracle on, on AWS. Because the good way is to start using cloud native data stores. This is your target. You don't want to run Oracle on RDS unless your application is like really uh, Oracle specific. This is, this is your long-term goal. The previous two, Oracle on RDS or Oracle on EC2 can be used for like intermediate steps so that you get comfortable with AWS, so that you can move your applications faster and don't need to rewrite them. But your final, final target should be always using cloud native data storage. And you will see why in the next, I don't know, uh, dozens of slides. Now, the biggest challenge with running Oracle or maybe any other non-cloud native database in AWS is, a, is the storage. And now I will briefly tell you how actually the RDS storage subsystem works behind the scenes as of today. Uh, RDS storage looks like a, a, a collection of four EBS volumes. It looks like this is not documented but in terms of uh, throughput, in terms of IOPS, in terms of size, it looks like this is what we have. And it has some really uh, specific uh, 
uh, responses. Uh, I, am, I have three links here. You will get them in the final presentation when you download it. There is a lot of fine details that are written here. I will just share some of those. Now, there are basically two types of storage that you can use in RDS. Unfortunately, uh, we still don't have the IO2. So I would tell them for the sake of simplicity, the cheap and the right way for production workloads. The cheap way is running GP2. We still don't have GP3 on RDS Oracle. Uh, GP2 is good for non-production workload. It can do the work. Uh, it can deliver relatively good performance, uh, but the most important problem of GP2 and the one uh, uh, and why you don't want to use it for production is found in one of the links that you have on the previous slide. AWS designs GP2 volumes to deliver their provisioned performance on 99% of the time. This is only two nines. This means that in theory, you can have 14, 15 minutes of bad performance per day. And this is not acceptable for critical production workloads. But it's fine for, for, for test and development or even for non-critical production databases. And it's cheaper. Uh, the other thing you can use is IO1. We still don't have IO2 or IO2 Block Express. Uh, we have slightly better throughput. We have way more IOPS. And we have more, way more control dials. But you have to pay for those IOPS and you have to pay beforehand. I will tell you uh, in, in a little while what I mean. RTS, uh, uh, the IO1 storage is designed uh, to deliver the provisioned performance 99.9% .9 of the time. This is 10 times better than GP2. And this is why I'm saying this is, this is the production database workload. Uh, this is where you put your critical databases, your production workloads. Now, once you have IO2 Block Express, I cannot wait. IO2 Block Express seems to be built with databases in mind. So it will get even better, but we're still not there. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is how actually, I don't know if you have a lot of experience with Oracle. I would guess not all of you are that familiar with Oracle database. Uh, you have to know something. A couple of weeks ago, Oracle, uh, the, the company, uh, Oracle Corporation, uh, had uh, its 45th anniversary. So Oracle has been designed 45 years ago and it's improving, 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 but it's not a cloud native data store. So what you will see on the next couple of slides is something that is been like this at least for three decades. So Oracle is reading data in two ways. Uh, the most common way for OTP databases is single block read. This means the Oracle database says to the storage, give me this eight kilobytes worth of data and the storage reads it and returns eight kilobytes worth of data, always eight kilobytes. Like you can change your database block size, but nobody does it actually. So give me eight kilobytes, here it is eight kilobytes. In terms of AWS, this is one IO uh, request for, to the EBS storage and it works fine as long as you are not exhausted uh, with your IOPS. Uh, because EBS considers anything less or equal to 16 kilobytes for one IO. There is also some optimization. If you require consecutive eight kilobytes or 16 kilobyte blocks, EBS is capable of merging this, then and reading it at once, but you cannot rely on this. The next thing Oracle can do in reading data, and this is more for analytical workloads or reporting, or you, if you have bad queries, uh, bad, badly designed or badly executed, is uh, multi-block read. Multi-block read means Oracle tells to the storage, give me di this big consecutive chunk of blocks and the DBA has influence how, how big chunks Oracle can request. Typically, let's say 256 kilobytes or even one megabyte. Give me this one megabyte and the storage goes, reads it and returns it to, to the database engine. The problem here is that if I require one megabyte one megabyte chunk of the storage. Behind the scenes, EPS will fulfill the request, but it will split it into four uh, 256 kilobyte uh, IO operations. So if I have 10,000 IOPS provisioned and I'm trying to do 10,000 multi-block reads, 
I will actually do only 2.5 thousand because one megabyte reading is, is actually four kilobytes. And you'll see on the next slide why this is why this is a problem. Now, after all this preamble, let me show you, if you don't know, what is actually Exadata and how it stands with RDS. Here, I have briefly mentioned the, the typical specification of, uh, of the Exadata. Exadata, you can, buy, you can buy a full cabinet of Exadata, so this is the whole rack. You can buy half rack, quarter rack, eight rack. Eight rack is the tiniest, tiniest little bit of, of thing you can buy. Uh, once you buy it, you can extend, you can say, I need more CPU, so I will add compute, uh, compute node, or I need more storage, so I will add storage node. And here you can see where the problem lies. One rack of X data has tremendous amount of CPUs, has incredible amount of RAM. Uh, okay, let's say we can have one terabyte here. Uh, here on, on the third column, I have the strongest, strongest, most expensive are this uh, piece of compute that you can get. And as you can see, like the strongest piece of compute has the same amount of memory as the tiniest, smallest texture data. In terms of IOPS and bandwidth, uh, th there's no comparison. So what are the problems that you face when you're trying to migrate your exadata workloads into RDS? First, as I told you, is the IO, like the maximum throughput you can pay for, like the even if you have all the money in the world, the maximum you can pay for in AWS is four gigabytes per second. This is more than order of magnitude less than the weakest extra data out there, like order of magnitude less. The maximum IOPS you can pay for is 256,000. And this will be very, very expensive storage if you if you provision such such amount of IOPS. And this is again two orders of magnitude less than the weakest weak exadata. And remember what I told you, every one megabyte read is split into four. So it, it, it gets even worse. And it really gets even worse because once the storage is saturated, if you if you read uh, if you reach your capacity, your provisioned capacity of the storage, especially in terms of a throughput. Uh, four gigabytes per second, then everything is slow. Exadata has smart algorithms because Exadata is built by Oracle from the hardware, operating system, all the uh, interconnection, then the uh, Linux kernel, then the uh, database kernel. It's built in a way so that even the storage cell knows, uh, okay, this is important, this should go first, this should go later. You have IO resource management. This, is, this can be done only if you have the whole stack by one vendor. In other words, you don't have this. So if somebody goes and runs a, a crazy query, you can throttle the whole database, which is which is not exactly great. So this is the problem with dial. The next problem is the CPU. The maximum you can get is 128 cores. And somebody will say, okay, that's a lot of cores. <sighs> yes, of course it is. But here is real world example uh, back in March, I believe. Uh, we had uh, plant release and some developer did some really not optimal uh, queries with the, with the new version of our software. And as you can see, we tried to use uh, 1.4 thousand CPU cores out of the 96 that we have provisioned. So <laughs> on Exadata, you can, you can survive this. In, in our case, this means that we were actually about 15 minutes down. You, you don't have the, the, the spare CPU bandwidth that you have on Exadata. And actually, if you reach even 80% CPU load, so if you provision, let's say, 100 CPU cores, even at 80, this is not sustainable. This is not a stable setup. Uh, once you reach 95, you are practically done. The third challenge that we have, the disk space. Uh, if, I, if I go back here, the smallest piece of Exadata you can buy has 324 terabytes of disk. You can reach petabytes. And if this is not enough, you can add more and more. It, it, it scales. Like every time you, you need more, you can buy an additional storage cell. And this additional storage cell will give you 12 hard drives 
and each one is I believe 14 terabytes each or, or 18 terabytes each. so we're talking about 200 terabytes of, like this is the smallest you can add in RDS the maximum you can have is 46 terabytes and uh, this is the maximum once you reach 64 terabytes game over like no money can buy now this is this is hardly and this includes not only your data files but your logs your dumps if you're using uh data pump for example so this is really a challenging limitation for us because uh we do have even now as we speak we do have one of our production databases is 50 terabytes in rds and i know from experience for running this database that this database grows by 50 percent year over the over year so uh <laughs> yeah that's a real challenge so we, we are currently pushing really hard to get rid of of, of things uh like developers love to store json in, in the data why would you put json in the relational database but it is what it is this, this is how it so those are the three main challenges you wouldn't have out of io uh, bandwidth you run out of cpu you run out of out of pace now someone can say okay but i don't have such monstrosity databases like like you maybe maybe my database runs on next data but it's not using that much uh of the of the bandwidth well let's check let's check this one uh i have built some specific sql statements like the good thing about oracle if you pay for it is that you can gather a lot of statistics so I, I i've put some sql and it's in the appendix we will not go through it because we don't have the time but you will have it in the final slides uh that will tell you how much throughput and iops and cpu uh you are actually your specific workload is actually running for the la using for the last one month or whatever it requires uh diagnostic pack license so beware but Running Oracle in production without diagnostic pack is, is a bad idea anyway. So I will now go through the SQL statements, but I will show you the result of one of the databases that uh, we have successfully migrated. So there we go. On the CPU side, we are using 10, 15, 20 CPU cores, which is which is fine. It's sustainable. Sometimes we go to 40, 70. That's that's extreme. It's still fine. You can provision up, up to 128 with R6 I32 X large. But on the IO subsystem, what do we have? We are running 184,000 IO operations per second on the 95th percentile. So I'm, I'm doing statistical analysis. On the 95th percentile, we're doing 184,000 IOPS. Even if I can provision this, it will be very, very expensive and very unstable. But I actually cannot provision this. But what is actually worse is that I'm using 43 terabyte, uh, 43 gigabytes per second. In RDS, the biggest, the, the meanest thing you can pay for is four gigabytes per second. And actually going above two gigabytes per second is, is, is very expensive. So we are dead, right? This, this database cannot ever go to, to AWS. Well, uh, obviously we did it. Uh, so I will give you a hint. In the last column, you see there is one thing. Exadata is very smart machine. So sometimes if, if the developers creates a really suboptimal query and then don't create index, Exadata can say to the storage cell, okay, go read this data, but I'm interested only in ID equals five. And the storage index helps you, you will not even read the data because the story cell or oh, what they do. So as you can see, 41 of these 43 gigabytes per second are not even read. The database requests those, but the story cell tells, no, no, you don't need it. So this means that we have some indexes missing. Let me tell you one thing. If you are running like us, if you're running connect the data for eight years, nine years, we, we do the data there will be low hanging fruits, believe me, because developers tend to become like, I don't want to say bad things about developers, but developers tend to become lazy. They just push sequels through whatever, and there will be low hanging fruits. So what have we done? Uh, Oracle has uh, this wonderful thing called 
automatic workload repository that can give you reports, okay, those are your top 10 or top, top 50 uh, queries by CPU. Those are your top 30 queries by IO requests. Those are top 10 queries by executions. So you start there, you see the queries that are hammering your database the most, and then you start optimizing. What can you do? The first thing that comes to everybody's mind, uh, you cannot index. Okay, but you can drop index. We had some real case. So here starts the, the real world thing. So far I have been introducing you to the problem. Here starts the real world thing. You can actually drop indexes. We had one, one table uh, storing uh, payments, transactions that has 15 indexes on it. This means that every time I do insert, I'm not writing into one box. I'm writing into 15 blocks. And if I insert 1000 times, I write into 15,000 blocks. So dropping indexes is also an option. Maybe there is some index that is not used and Oracle can tell you, okay, this index is not used. The other thing you can do is you can do profiles and baselines. This is DBA black magic. Uh, if you have Oracle database, DBAs, they will know what to do. This is more or less, if you have some query and the, the query optimizer couldn't find the best execution plan, you can tell him, okay, okay, optimizer, try this, this other approach. And this is uh, the indexes and the baselines. This, this is daily, daily stuff. Uh, if this doesn't help, you can challenge the developers and tell them uh, they have to rewrite the queries. They, they will be reluctant at first, but if you tell them they have AWS, they love AWS, so they will be cooperative eventually. Uh, rewriting queries uh, really helps if, if, if the queries are, are written in, in suboptimal way. Uh, the next thing you can do, don't be afraid to challenge the business requirements. Uh, I will tell you one real world case. We, we identified that there is some report that is automatically scheduled to run every hour and it's hammering the database with a lot of IO. So we, we reverse engineered it and we found which, which team is actually potentially using it and went to the team asking them, okay guys, this is really hard query. Can we run it once a day instead of every hour? And they said, what? what? We, we don't use this report for two years already. So we, we just disabled it. So, but like, this is the, the lucky case. Anyway, don't be afraid to change the business. Like you can go to your finance controller and tell them, okay, you want this report every hour, but it will cost you this amount of money. And he'll say, okay, let's do it once a day. Uh, the other thing that we do, and we do a lot, is to migrate functionality to other systems. Uh, we we built a wonderful uh, data lake in Snowflake, and we are actively offloading reporting queries from the OTP database to the Snowflake. And I know those things should not run on OTP, but they do. There is no pure OTP. I, I, I haven't seen pure OTP databases. So this is this is this is something that can be done. And all the things that I, I have written here, after just two or three, maybe four sprints with the developers, with, with some focus teams, uh, allowed us to go distance. Uh, the IOPS are not 184,000 on the 95th, it's 30,000. 30,000 IOPS, it's still notable amount, but it's doable. And, and the gigabytes per second, we are doing 1.6 gigabit gigabytes per second, which is very doable. Like it's not cheap, but it's doable. It allows us to actually move. Uh, this is this is how it looks on the on the graph. This is for one week. As you can see, we have daily fluctuations. We have higher workload in the evening, lower low workload in the early early morning. Uh, I can move this to AWS, and we did move this to AWS. So instead of using 200,000 IOPS, 30K, okay. This needs some money, but it's doable. But that's not the end. Because once you move to AWS, like there are some things that you see once you are on the new system. So we, we kept on pushing the developers. We kept on pushing the business. Okay, let's try to optimize this. Let's try to optimize that. And only five months later, uh, we, are, we are here we are actually picking up to 15, uh, 16,000 IOPS. So it's, it's 
Iteration after iteration, we are getting better and better and better. In a nutshell, don't be afraid of the initial stuff. You have to measure how bad it is. The SQL statements that you'll find in the appendix of the presentation are for this. And then improve, improve, improve. They, there are low-hanging fruits. So, by the way, I, I really prefer live face-to-face -face sessions. Uh, I didn't want to go to Kiev, but again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me at any time, Dmitry. Uh, Dennis, sorry. Uh, now, we decided that we can move to RDS. What tools we can use to migrate our database workload to RDS? Uh, there, we use three types of tools. The first one is Oracle Data Pump. Oracle Data Pump is uh, like you do logical export of your database or tables or users or whatever, and then you copy it in RDS. It has some cumbersome procedure to S3 and whatnot, but it's very well documented. You import it. This is all fine and good, but this means that you export it at one point of time and the export can take minutes, days, I don't know, hours. Uh, you copy, this takes time. You import it, this takes time which means this is not really applicable for live traffic because you lose data if you if you switch over so the other thing you can use is amazon's dms service dms service is something that is uh getting better and better with 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 months a uh, couple of years ago when we started it was really crappy now it's rather stable i have to say it still has some some edges here and there, but it's really improving. Uh, DMS allows you to do not only initial export import, but it, it allows you to have the ongoing replication so you don't actually lose data. And at the day of the switch, you just switch and you have all your data there, which is great. But uh, what we actually used is Oracle Golden Gate. Oracle Golden Gate is similar to DMS uh it's uh more way more expensive but we had the license anyway uh, it's oracle product for replicating from one database to the other it can replicate oracle to oracle or sql server ibm db2 postgre whatever uh it's very flexible it's command line tool uh can do really really a lot of things and it's really rock solid it has some steep learning curve but we're using it for years and it costs some license, but we had the license. So this is this is uh, what we use for migrating our critical workloads. For development, data pump is good enough. And the last thing I want to mention is Golden Gate Vary Data. It's one even more expensive tool. It allows you to compare uh, to databases as they are replicating. It's really flexible. You want to make sure that your data is correctly copied. Believe me, I'm talking out of experience out of uh not in the experience i see we are running out of time unfortunately but the other things that you have to do before you decide to to switch over you have to agree with the business do you need all the data uh, exadata has tons of, of storage space maybe i don't need all the 20 years of transactions maybe i need only the last five or seven or whatever our regulations force me to because storage space costs money, storage size means that I need more time to, to copy this to database. Other than this, you have to agree beforehand with the business, what are your RTO and RPO? Uh, can I afford to lose some data for payment systems? Absolutely no, zero RPO. Uh, how much downtime can I have? We have systems that are fine with, with hours of downtime, two hours, three hours are fine. We have systems that are not fine even with, with 10 minutes. Uh, and this, uh, this leads to different solutions when you are starting the, uh, when, when you are architecting the process of, of the migration. Uh, what else? You need to define together with your business, your success criteria. Maybe we have uh, a business, pro we have a payment that goes for 130 milliseconds on prem. If we go to the cloud and run for 150, is it okay or not? What about 160 or 200 or 500 or 2000? Where, where is the limit? 
what is what is acceptable and what is not. You have to know this beforehand because when you switch, you need this information in, in order to make decisions. Believe me, during the switch, everybody is nervous. So you have to know. Data validation. How do you validate the data? Validate is wonderful thing, but maybe you don't have very data. So what can you do? Maybe count the roles for the previous day or run some financial reports here and there, compare the numbers. Are they up to the last uh, cent or, or, or not? You have to come up with agreement with the business what is what means your data is valid in the cloud because later when auditors knock on your door, you have to have this prepared and documented. Other than this, you have to agree on the fallback approach. Okay, we switched over and this transaction goes from 100 milliseconds to 10 seconds. This is not acceptable. Uh, then what do we do? Maybe we can try to improve it. Uh, some live debugging at the night of the switch. Okay, this is fine. How long? 30 minutes, two hours, eight hours, 10 minutes. Agree beforehand. Who decides is it fine or not? Who is the decision maker? Agree beforehand. This has to be known at the day of the switch. Uh, I'm talking about fallback. Fallback means that you you need not only to make replication from on-prem to AWS, but you have to have a replication mechanism from AWS back to on-prem. How long do we keep it? This is really uh, problematic because two-way replication can break at any time. So do we need to keep it only until the business says fine in five minutes or in one hour? Do we need to keep it for the next one week maybe or one month? We have business unit that requires us to keep it nine months after we, we, we move to AWS. Not that they are switching back, but this is the business it requires it, so we do it. Okay. Now, at the day of the switch, uh, you want to be as fast as possible. You don't want a lot of daytime. Prepare. Test. Everything has to be scripted. No manual steps. Manual is slow. Manual is not repeatable. All the teams have to do have to know what they are doing. Test on a system that is as close as possible to the production. Identify where you where you are losing time and test again and again. Believe me when I'm saying we reached a, a position where we can switch over 40 terabytes database with less than two minutes of downtime. But this this required a lot of dials. Uh, there is wonderful thing that you can do with Oracle using DB services. Uh, you will see it in the presentation. We don't have time for this. Uh, this is the procedure that we use for the, for the switchover itself. You have to do it in the lowest load time. As I've shown you, we have this daily fluctuation. Maybe you have it monthly or whatever, because you want to have as little business affected as possible. And other than this, in the process of switching over, you have to kill all everything that is running on-prem in order to have consistent database. This takes time. Killing thousands of sessions takes time. So you have to have a few fewer sessions as few as possible and still be like this is before the downtime. Now you switched. We are monitoring the database. Unfortunately, as I told you, I have too many slides. You will see it. It's wonderful. This is one of the things I really like about AWS, all the monitoring features that you have. So the last thing I want to say is the lessons learned. In a nutshell, Oracle can run in RDS. It may be cumbersome. It may be expensive. The DBAs will not like it initially. Actually, two years later, we still don't really enjoy it, but we know it can be done. It may be done as a first step to migrating to cloud native data stores. It may be done for a few months or for a few years. It's doable. You cannot achieve the same availability as on-prem. It will be more expensive. And believe me, it will be more expensive than on-prem. In contrast with all the applications that will be cheaper and better and everything, Oracle database will be more expensive than on-prem, but it will run. It's, it's kind of, it's still reliable. The important thing that there are a lot of technology challenges. Every wonderful database solutions team can do it. The biggest challenge is the mindset change. You have to start thinking the cloud way. You have to change your, your approach to the database. And this is one also very important lesson that we, lesson that we learned the right way. 
don't be afraid to look for partner. There are companies out there. I'm not selling services. We are product company. We're not selling. This. I can sell you uh, say, uh, payment services, but not AWS services. So I'm not selling our services. Work with partner. There are companies we, we use the services of House of Bricks, wonderful company focused on moving Oracle to AWS. Uh, you can use other companies like Sintra that are doing the same. There are a lot of options out there. Don't be afraid to, to call for help because it's it's a challenge. The other thing, uh, really fast, everything in the cloud costs money. We are turning into accountants and nobody likes this, but it is fact of life. Uh, availability is a challenge. As I told you, you cannot have the same availability as on-prem. The storage sometimes freezes when expanding or when you lose a storage node. Behind the scenes, Ada was kind of fix it, but you have a few dozens of seconds of downtime. You have to learn to live with this. And patching Oracle databases in RDS, this, that's a huge pain in the neck. Like, especially compared to cloud native data stores like Dynamo, where you don't have to patch or Aurora. Uh, minor version patch on a, date, on a multi AD database takes somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes of downtime, which is so unfortunate. The same for Aurora takes between 10 and 20 seconds of downtime. And the last slide, it's really about the mindset change. Like you have to, you have to make your DBAs believe into this because otherwise like technical solutions, te technical challenges are solvable. The, the, the steepest learning curve was for, for me and for my team to actually embrace the new, the new way, embrace the, the, the new approach. What's next? Cloud native data stores. This is where we are moving and we are moving very aggressively. We already moved terabytes of workloads to Aurora. We are looking into memory DB, into Dynamo, uh, S3, of course. Why would you put pictures, scan documents in, in Oracle database? Yeah, it was easy on Exit Data, but now it costs money. So move them to S3. This is where you have to, to aim for, not for, for the uh, Oracle on RDS. This is, this is where you have to aim for. Now, I know I'm out of time. Any questions are more than welcome now, or you can reach me in LinkedIn, or you can reach me the, any, any way you want. That's all for now. Thank you. That's a great presentation, man. Really. Uh, I would just mention that we need at least two hours. If I, if imagine if I am interrupting you, so we will, you, you know, it, it is a really huge discussion and uh, really interesting about monitoring. You you just skip them, but uh, in general, it would be nice to probably talk a little bit more about it. Uh, also, I'm just thinking about, you know, this is a really huge system. The capacity you showed really impressed. And uh, I'm just imagine like architect, how you support on-prem and uh, migration uh, stage. So in some period of time, you need support both databases, right? Uh, in on-prem and uh, in RDS, or you will done migration once time, right? Stop your services. But as you mentioned, it probably financial uh, application, right? And it is impossible to stop the uh, production, right? So how you deal with the data migration? So petabytes of data, it takes days for migration and uh, data should be consistent between on-prem and RDS. So maybe a few words about it. <laughs> so how it's happened. Yeah. One of the slides that I have to skip is this one. What is the biggest selling point of Oracle X data? And believe me, I ha I've done presentation. Oracle actually invited me to do presentations all across Europe to sell X data, me as non Oracle guy, to potential Oracle customers for X data. What is the biggest selling point of X data? It's not the tremendous uh, throughput that you can have, it's not the millions and millions of files. It's not uh, the, all the CPU and, and, and all the ingenious technology. The biggest selling point of Exadata is that this is engineered system that comes from one vendor. 
So there is no finger pointing. If you have troubles, if something is slow, uh, Oracle cannot tell you, uh, go ask with the storage vendor because they are the storage vendor. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is related to your support question. On-prem, it's, it's really easy on Exadata because everything that, that we need to do, we just uh, ask Oracle. And yeah, Oracle support is not the most responsive support out there, but there are ways to make them work for you. So, so it's easier. Now in, in AWS, we file a ticket to Oracle and they say, oh, that's AWS, so ask, ask them. And AWS, <laughs> they can try and, and do their best, but they say, no, no, that's the Oracle kernel. So the finger pointing starts. This is why I'm selling the cloud native data stores. If I have problem with Aurora, I can keep AWS responsible for this. Like top to bottom, everything comes from them. Uh, if I have, by the way, we are really happy with Snowflake, but you can use other cloud native data stores like Atlas, for example, that, that runs perfectly fine. Uh, so try like somebody will say, oh, but this means vendor lock-in. Okay, but it makes my life easier because I'm operating it. That's uh, right. So, so this is about the operations problem. Uh, for, for, for the monitoring, I really like the, the, the CloudWatch uh, dashboard that gives me really, I can put a lot of databases here and it really gives me, at, at a glance, I can see what happens with my database. The other thing I like, uh, the CloudWatch alarms through SNS, they can ping me on pager duty or send emails or, or, or whatnot. Uh, the RDS performance insights is getting better and better, better as you speak. And, and the good thing is that it gives you more or less the same functionality for Oracle as for Aurora, more or less. So yeah, we have sorry, a lot of we need to stop. Yeah, I see there a lot of information. Sorry, uh, we have yes. at least six, seven questions in the Q and A uh, chat in Pine. So if you can join to Pine and answer on the question, because there are some interesting related to Snowflake and the capacity of your on-prem and RDS, is it really needed such capacity? So please answer that questions because there are a lot of them. They are interesting. Thank you again for yeah, your sure. speech. Really interesting story. Just inspired, you know. Thank you, man, and uh, have a nice day.